Um, so um, again, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today um, to review the very important topic of taking an occupational health history and best practices and benefits. Um, today, we are lucky to have two wonderful speakers. Um, first, we have Dr. Yelena Globina. She is a board-certified occupational and preventive medicine physician. Dr. Globina has over 11 years of experience diagnosing and treating work-related injuries, including WTC responder ex responders exposed at ground zero. She is also experienced in creating and implementing worker health and safety programs. Dr. Globina is an associate professor at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai and is the medical director of the Staten Island location of the Selikoff Centers for Occupational Health. Um, then we have Dr. Deborah Akinshalo. Uh, she is a first generation physician born to Nigerian immigrants in Southern California. She obtained her undergraduate degree in history with a minor in public health at the University of California, Los Angeles before briefly switching allegiances while obtaining her master's in science in global medicine across town at the University of Southern California. She completed her medical studies at St. George's University School of Medicine in Granada. She went on to complete an internship in general surgery before joining the occupational and environmental medicine residency at the Icon School of Medicine. So those are our speakers for today. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Salikoff Centers. Um, so we are uh, a part of the Icon School of Medicine on Mount Sinai in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health. Um, we are one of the clinics who are a member of the Occupational Health Clinic Network. Um, and New York State is very unique in that it has a network of clinics specifically dedicated to work with um, workers who are injured um, in the workplace. Um, keeping workers healthy and their workplaces safe is at the core of everything that we do. We have a multidisciplinary team of physicians, ergonomists, um, uh, industrial hygienists, and other colleagues who diagnose and treat occupational injuries and illnesses, which also includes COVID-19. The employer or the worker is our patient. Um, we also partner with unions, community-based organizations, and worker centers to support workers' occupational health needs and establish programs to enhance worker safety and health. We have a really wonderful outreach and education team who spearheads this work. And we have a couple of locations. We have two locations in the Mid-Hudson Valley, um, one in Suffern and one in Yonkers. We have a location on, on Mount Sinai's main campus in Upper Manhattan, and we also have a location in Staten Island. Um, so without further ado, I um, present my colleague, Dr. Yelena Globina. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to share a, a pretty fundamental skill that I hope that after our presentation, um, all the clinicians in the group are able to incorporate into their clinical um, patient care. And, okay. Um, ha having experience working as an occupational medicine physician, I know that not everybody is familiar with the field. So I wanted to start uh, by giving uh, an overview of what is an occupational, what is the field of occupational and environmental medicine. And uh, what we do is we focus on the health of workers, uh, their ability to perform work, um, their potential exposures, uh, and both in the environment as well as in the workplace. And these range from physical hazards, chemical, biological, as well as uh, social. And then the health outcomes of these exposures um, uh, with the goal of health promotion, disease prevention, um, as well as prevention <clears throat> and management of um, injury, illnesses, and disability. 
So today I will review uh, a variety of reasons to take an occupational health history. Uh, we'll go through the skills and then Dr. Akinshilo will uh, really get to the most interesting part is the case presentation. Um, so why should somebody take uh, an occupational history? Well, it's because when somebody comes to you and they're complaining of this, you have to make sure that this is not what they do for eight hours of their day. Um, and uh, some other reasons uh, I will go through is one is occupation and environmental causes of disease, although not um, ascertained all the time, can have a significant impact uh, on diagnosis, disease progression, as well as success of your treatment. And some of the examples that uh, are encountered quite frequently in the um, all clinical settings, uh, especially in primary care, I would say, uh, you know, or, or urgent care settings, you know, you may see a patient with asthma, but is it a patient who is a restaurant worker who, uh, you know, has asthma exacerbations every time he's exposed to uh, cleaning vapors and fumes from um, you know, strong oven cleaning chemicals. Uh, are you seeing a patient with hearing loss? Uh, but, you know, is it a construction worker who is exposed to loud noises most of their day? Um, you know, are you seeing a, a farmer or utility worker with heat related illness? And are, are there safety concerns at work? Uh, so multiple, multiple examples uh, that we can encounter. And if we don't think of asking about what they do for a living or what is in their environment, we may uh, miss an opportunity to, uh, you know, intervene and prevent future illness. Um, and then uh, what I was alluding to here are really the sentinel health events in the workplace. Uh, is one of the things that we focus on as occupational medicine physicians. Uh, you know, by taking occupational health history, uh, making the connection with the disease, uh, if there is one, you can make a significant impact on preventing future illness, um, as well as uh, disease disability and untimely death. And to give you an example that I've I thought was quite striking and interesting. Um, there was an epidemiologic, uh, a successful epidemiologic investigation uh, conducted by the Minnesota Health Department back in 2007. And uh, the, uh, the, the problem that they were presented with are a pork processing plant workers uh, complaining of various neurological symptoms. And uh, what had triggered this was there was an increase in production, uh, as well as implementation of a new air compression technique. And it turned out that because of this new technique, increase in production, the workers were exposed to inhaled bits of pig brain. And those uh, cause an autoimmune response uh, affecting the nervous system. And after the Minnesota Health Department uh, conducted an epidemiologic investigation into this outbreak, um, the technique was discontinued and there was no further recurrent illness. And I encourage you to take a look at this case because it is absolutely fascinating the way they had made the connection and really, um, prevented really, uh, you know, many, many uh, future potential cases and a lot of associated disability. In an acute care setting, you want to think about occupational history, uh, especially when uh, facing acute poisoning, for instance. Uh, we are all familiar with certain toxidromes and organophosphate uh, pesticide poisoning and somebody who's using insecticides especially uh, is something that should come to mind uh, when you're seeing in a, a patient with uh, parasympathetic overstimulation and uh, a common acronym that probably everyone is familiar with is dumbbells uh, for their syndromic presentation. Um, less exciting, uh, but no less relevant, uh, uh, patients may ask you to complete a variety of forms, uh, be it workers' compensation, disability, return to work, fitness for duty, uh, pre-employment or pre-placement clearance forms. 
And, uh, you know, these are part of our daily lives and without understanding what the occupational demands are of a patient's, um, uh, uh, for, for this patient, of this patient's occupation, uh, you may not be able uh, to do this uh, correctly. And if I haven't convinced you with the forms that occupational health history is a very important part of uh, our patient's health, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, cites that in 2021, a worker died every 101 minutes from a work-related injury. So uh, with that, I wanted to move into the next part of my presentation, which is uh, really focusing on acquiring, and at least right now, familiarizing yourself with the skills uh, of taking an occupational health history. Um, it is different from what we're used to in the clinical setting. Uh, so I will dive into each section with a little bit more detail. So during a routine survey, uh, you want to pay close attention to the temporal relationship between the clinical presentation and a patient's uh, aggravating uh, factors as well as alleviating factors. So to give an example, uh, you know, if somebody is uh, coming to you um, in an outpatient setting with hand and wrist pain, and uh, you ask them what makes them worse, well, it's typing without breaks, um, and what improves it, oh, I actually get much better when I'm uh, away on vacation or on the weekends. You know, you may want to think about, is this uh, something that really requires intervention, um, oh, you know, for this patient at work, if, uh, if you know, if they're typing without breaks, you may uh, want to intervene in addition to providing standard treatment, uh, such as wrist braces um, and doing the basic workup for um, hand and wrist pain and, and sensory changes. Uh, another aspect uh, of the routine survey of this initial part of uh, uh, occupational health history is exposure assessment. And in the review of systems, when you focus on the exposure assessment, you want to think about various routes of exposure as well as, uh, you know, what could a patient be potentially exposed to? So you, you want to ask them about all of these things, including uh, general uh, history, uh, social history, uh, history of their medications, uh, their current medications list, as well as uh, conduct a succinct uh, list of current past jobs, as well as uh, hobbies they may have at home. Uh, and then you move on into an expanded job list or a much more, uh, you know, focused um, uh uh, sorry, my history that is uh, much more detailed in terms of what a patient does for a living, how long they have done uh, a particular job, uh, where they've done it, what products they've manufactured, um, as well as getting details of uh, their job descriptions, workstation design, uh, what kind of materials they're using. And it's important to go back to uh, uh, not only to the current, uh, but also to the recent and distant past, because some of the exposures and the most infamous one is probably asbestos. Some of the, these occupational exposures can manifest themselves clinically um, only you know, a decade or more later. Uh, you want to ask about what exposure controls are in place. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a brief introduction into the hierarchy of controls, um, meaning, you know, if there is uh, a particularly toxic uh, substance that is being used at work, for instance, a cleaning chemical, can it be eliminated? Has it been eliminated uh, with complaints uh, from the workers about particular symptoms, um, et cetera? And uh, you, know, you want to ask whether others are experiencing similar symptoms at work um, that could often be indicative of, um, of, of an exposure, of a toxic exposure. And uh, very uh, perhaps one of the most critical pieces is, has there been a change in work practice? It is very common that when nothing else changes except for work pace and work volume, uh, for example, with layoffs, um, 
things uh, that were, uh, you know, pretty controlled or, you know, exposures that may have had some kind of subclinical effect really begin to manifest themselves and you start seeing um, ill and injured workers. You want to ask um, uh, and think about potential toxic exposures at home. Uh, so uh, where is the patient's home located? You know, is it next to a hazardous waste site or an industrial plant? Um, you know, what is the air quality like? Uh, what is the age and condition of the residents? Is there peeling paint? Um, is, you know, what are the heating sources and have there been done, uh, have there been any recent renovations? All of these can unmask uh, potential hazardous exposures. And uh, furthermore, you want to ask about what kind of cleaning agents, insecticides or pesticides uh, somebody must, might be using. What is the insulation and ventilation like, water sources, and another really important factor not to forget about is whether a parent, uh, spouse, partner is changing clothing before uh, they come home from work or are they bringing whatever uh, they may be exposed at work, for example, construction dust, are they bringing it into the house? Um, you uh, may then uh, dive into really uh, trying to identify uh, where a toxic exposure has taken place. Um, it's important to review or to try to gain access to material safety data sheets. They will generally provide a lot of information on what type of chemicals are used at work. Uh, there are colloquial terms, names, and also um, uh, you know, how a particular hazard should be mediated, what are the potential um, modes of entry and exposure. Uh, you want to ask a patient about the degree of their exposure. So when talking about exposure to dust, ask about thickness of the dust cloud. You know, you can't see clearly through it. So, you know, it's very um, high intensity dust exposure. Uh, noise levels. Is it too loud to communicate with your coworkers? They can give you an idea of how loud uh, the ambient noise is. And also think about various modes of entry. Of entry. So is a potential hazard uh, ingested, inhaled, or um, is it absorbed through the skin? And uh, along with that, how is uh, a toxic substance handled? You know, operating practices, cleaning practices, and what protective measures um, are in place. And then you come to a resolution. Um, uh, once you've gathered all the information, uh, put it together along with the patient symptoms. If you have a uh, suspicion that somebody is um, having work-related issues or work-aggravated issues, so for instance, um, you know, somebody has asthma, but uh, much like that restaurant worker had mentioned, you know, they may have underlying asthma, but there's certain chemicals at work that they cannot use and you've identified them as a trigger of asthma attacks for them, uh, please refer them to an occupational medicine specialist because we will help them navigate the workplace, um, uh, you know, and allow for uh, successful uh, really remain either to remain at work or um, help them with alternatives and find alternatives um, while addressing their health related problems. So at the top of the slide is uh, two ways you can refer to our clinic, uh, the Selikov Centers for Occupational Health and all of the locations uh, by calling uh, the number that's on the slide. And also um, if you use Epic, you can refer to us through Epic and there's a referral link. Uh, or wording, I should say. And uh, for your patient, it's very important to um, make sure that this patient is being monitored, um, you know, whether it's outpatient or inpatient, depending on the severity of their problem, and uh, perhaps medical establishing medical surveillance programs, such as hearing conservation programs, where you know there's exposure um, and uh, the workers need to be uh, monitored for any adverse effects. 
Um, you know, we at the clinic uh, can offer work site visits um, with an industrial hygienist who can do um, assessments and that can be extremely valuable. Um, and also ergonomic evaluations where you can really address any hazards in a, a workstation design. And um, occupational medicine physicians are well equipped um, for uh, uh, helping patients navigate uh, rather complex workers' compensation systems. And so oftentimes that is a necessary aspect uh, where uh, a workplace injury and is certainly where workplace uh, illness occurs. So with that, I wanted to show you a summary um, of uh, a quick, um, um, a tree that you can use uh, to help you as a cheat sheet if you know if you want to add this. And I encourage you to add this as a part of uh, your occupational or, or, or your, your clinical encounters. And um, uh, without further ado, I wanted to uh, pass the mic to my colleague, Dr. Akinshilo, and she will present a case that uh, truly exemplifies the importance of diving into the occupational history in order to arrive at the correct diagnosis and treatment. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, all. I am um, Deborah Tinchlow. I am a PGY3 in the Occupational and Environmental Medicine Training Program at Sinai. And I would like to share with you a case of a patient that I saw at Um, our patient, because we'll be taking this trip together, is a 35-year-old uh, female security guard who's presenting to sell a cough uh, with a complaint of progressively worsening, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough um, since mid-June. She presents in um, October. She was recently diagnosed with asthma, was previously treated with inhaled corticosteroids and multiple short courses of prednisone of variable doses, uh, with the most recent one being five milligrams for one week, but she did not experience any sort of symptom improvement. And she was concerned her symptoms were connected to mold she saw at her workplace. So um, I'll take you on a little journey, like I said, through her um, clinical course. So she first presents for medical care after developing these symptoms in mid-June, in early August, to the emergency department with a complaint of chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, their history notes that she had a prior isolated respiratory illness in 2019. There was no mention of her work at home environments. Um, and typically when a patient like this presents to the ED with these sorts of symptoms, you wonder about um, asthma exacerbation, um, community acquired pneumonia, if there's fever, and then long list of other differential diagnoses. Um, the images you see here were the um, chest x-rays that were performed in the emergency department. And I think um, most providers um, would say that this is likely a normal chest x-ray. Um, and she was told that her x-ray looked a little fluffy, but she had no acute illness. She wasn't she had a fever, she didn't have a white count. Um, and so she was given ibuprofen for her pain, um, which was the chest tightness without signs of acute infection or cardiac, cardiac etiology. Then she presented to her PCP for follow-up. Um, and he sees her in later August for cough and rash. Um, she had a history of eczema. And so she, had, she was dysmic on presentation and given duonets in clinic. Um, the assessment was that she had asthma, new onset asthma, and she was prescribed albuterol and flovent and then referred to pulmonology. All right, so then in September, she presents to urgent care um, for worsening difficulty breathing. And for the first time, the question of uh, work comes up. Um, and a note is made of the work environment con contaminated with mold because she had noted mold on a chair at work um, at the end of August. So she was prescribed 50 milligrams of prednisone for five days. And since she already had an appointment with the pulmonologist, she was to follow up with them. 
So 11 days later, she sees the pulmonologist. There are more questions about her work in home environments. Um, they note that the, dust, the dusty nature of her work environment and um, the fact that there was extensive mold found in the workplace. So they um, send off for PFTs, pulmonary function tests, um, to assess the nature of the pulmonary issues. An allergy panel is also ordered. Um, she follows up one week later with allergy labs in hand. They note that the allergy panel is positive for trees, ragweed, ragweed and fungi. And then on her second visit, she's referred to Selikoff Center to learn about air quality surveillance and possible mitigation protocols for her workplace. Slow down and you can talk a little bit. So, so um, October 2021, she presents to Selikoff. Um, and this is the history we get from her. She's a security guard who worked five days a week um, since her company reopened after pandemic closure. Um, she noted to have, she was not going to have shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough since mid June. It was progressively worsening. She presented to the ED early August. X ray looked a little fluffy, but there was no acute illness. She was diagnosed with asthma by her PCP, started on treatment with inhalers, saw a pulmonologist who added um, prednisone, uh, no relief. Uh, she received no relief from any of these treatments. And she wonders if the mold she saw at her workplace was noted to have, um, which was noted to have water damage and mold growth in the break room, as well as near her station, which was located under the AC. Um, is the cause of her issues. So she's been out of work at this point in October for over one month, but her symptoms haven't improved. Um, her physical exam was significant for um, crackles that didn't clear with coughing, and she definitely coughed throughout the interview and the physical exam. Um, her diagnosis now came to be um, based on her history, on the physical exam, and the PFTs that fortunately were um, in hand when she presented was hypersensitivity pneumonitis due to mold exposure. Um, her RASP panel, which you can see in the um, upper right corner here, uh, which corresponds to IG, IgE um, or causes of type one hypersensitivity reactions, suggests that she was allergic to aspergillus, um, fumigatus and alternaria alternata as well as multiple tree types and ragweed. Um, we um, decided to order imaging and further labs because typically with HP, you wanna order a, um, an HP panel, which is an IgG panel. Um, and her IgG to aspergillus was negative. Um, and unfortunately, um, an IgG for alternaria was not available. And so there are a number of other molds that could be the causative agent. Um, as we didn't know exactly what she was exposed to, but with um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis panels, typically they only include about six of the most common allergens, which means we can miss a lot. Um, and as such, a negative HP panel doesn't rule out HP as a diagnosis. Um, and in terms of treating it, the first step in treatment for HP is allergen avoidance. And she was already um, doing that due to the inability to work given her symptoms. Um, given that, we opted to give a, a stronger inhaled corticosteroid to see if that provided improvement since uh, Simplicort really wasn't working for her. Um, we restarted her on prednisone, um, 20 milligrams daily. Uh, which was a higher dose than what she had most recently taken. And then um, in terms of HP, further treatment includes things like systemic steroids or alternative um, agents like um, immune modulatory agents, antifibrotic agents. Um, and just a quick note about her PFTs. So she was um, originally thought to have asthma, but as you, I don't know how many of you are familiar with PFTs, but um, this one demonstrates a, a restrictive pattern. And with asthma, that's an obstructive pattern or obstructive disease um, disorder. And so you wouldn't expect to um, someone with asthma to have a restrictive pattern on their pulmonary function test. 
So that also hinted to us that there was something else going on. Just a little bit more about hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, and so it has a lot of aliases. Um, it was first found in 1932. And since then, um, the causative agents have been, uh, I think, I don't want to say innumerable, but there are very many. Um, and based on the causative agent, you might hear something, some other name, farmer's lung, bird keeper's lung, cheese lung. And so globally, bird-related hypersensitivity pneumonitis is the most commonly reported form. Um, in terms of the immunologic aspects of it, it's a cellular immune response um, to inhaled antigens. So it typically starts off as a type 3 hypersensitivity um, reaction. And then with prolonged exposure, it can um, give way to sensitization to the antigens that remain and persist in the alveoli and interstitium and therefore become a type 4 hypersensitivity um, reaction. It's um, interesting to note that um, cigarette smoking decreases the risk of developing clinically significant HP, and that's likely due to uh, nicotine inhibiting macrophage activation and lymphocyte proliferation. But smokers who develop um, HP have been shown to have more severe courses and higher mortality. And so just a sidebar in that our patient was, had a very short smoking history. I think it was 1.5 packs at most. Um, and when, um, in terms of clinical presentation, when presenting acutely, they might experience fevers, chills, myalgias, dyspnea, uh, wheezing, rails. And typically, this presentation gets confused with other acute pulmonary conditions. It's not odd to see that um, someone presenting with HP may initially be diagnosed with asthma or community acquired pneumonia, and they may get treated with albuterol or antibiotics and do not improve. Um, in her case, they were slowly um, getting closer to her diagnosis in that uh, they start with her, you know, off as someone who has asthma, then with further investigation and revealed she did not. Um, with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, often um, they present with cough, dyspnea on exertion, cyanosis, clubbing, um, the fingers, um, right ventricular heart failure, and then squeaks where like very little air is getting into the lungs. Um, in the case of our patient, I didn't pay very close attention to her fingernails on her initial assessment. Um, and that's because our, our new patient appointments can be very involved. Uh, with getting the detailed occupational exposure history. Um, but in the second appointment, I did query her about changes to her nails as they appeared club. Um, and she did endorse that her fingers were a bit more rounded um, than prior. Right. And so now that you have a general idea of what's going on with um, our patient, I'd like to focus on the areas of her history that helped us to make this diagnosis. Um, and this is the um, algorithm that Dr. Kobina previously shared. And so, as I mentioned previously, uh, at Selikoff, our new patient appointments can be very involved um, with getting a very thorough occupational history. And so it does take some time. And fortunately, we have a welcome packet that helps with this and asks for details regarding employment history and any toxic exposures that they may be aware of related to each job. So start with the routine survey of our um, patient. And so she was, had been in her current position since early 2015. So it's about six years before she started developing symptoms. Um, previous to that, she worked in retail, and with uh, retail positions, you worry more so about ergonomic issues rather than toxic exposures. Um, it's unclear when the building developed water damage, but she had noted that there was mold prior to when she first, um, there was mold and then she first noted it in the break room as well. So um, we assessed the temporal nature of her symptoms um, and with HP, you may see some involvement on um, improvements on weekends when they are away from the exposure. But in her case, she didn't note much of an improvement. 
in terms of um, any sort of triggers, she um, expressed the concern that her previous diagnosis wasn't correct. Um, and because she wasn't getting better. And so the most important clue in that regard was that she had this concern um, about her mold in her workplace, which was new from prior. And so she also noted that a coworker had a persistent cough as well, but that they had not sought treatment. And so in terms of her workplace, um, her duties um, required that she walk throughout the interior um, and around the exterior of the building. As I mentioned before, her chair was located under the um, under an AC vent, and so um, she, and she had noted that there was mold on her chair and again in the break room as well. Um, she reported mold growth to the custodian, and the building was later closed for mold remediation. Um, in terms of her residence or her home surroundings, um, sometimes it can be a little difficult getting specific information from patients on the state of their residence um, as they feel it's a, a intrusive. And they don't quite understand the need to exclude their home um, as a cause of their issues, but she was very forthcoming. And she said that she resided in an apartment that had been recently renovated. There was no um, mold or water damage, no rodents. Um, she had no close contact with birds in free time or any other time. And then she had a small pet dog that she'd had for more than six years and never had any issues around prior. And so um, when we think about uh, some of the impacts of what uh, delayed diagnosis or referral can have, and in terms of this patient, then we can think of the health costs um, and she continued to remain exposed to her contaminated work environment for two months after she developed clinically significant um, symptoms. And then her initial diagnosis was uh, delayed, or her initial diagnosis delayed her receiving a treatment that would sufficiently treat her condition. Um, the, show this for you all. This is a CT of um, her after she presented to Selikoff. And so after we had diagnosed her empirically with um, HP, clinically HP. So I think um, we can all agree that to the naked eye, these lungs don't look very good. Um, and the read on this was um, consolidation in both posterior lung bases, patchy ground glass opacities along the periphery of both lungs, and bilateral lower lobe bronchiectasis. That might sound familiar because of the pandemic we have just gone through. And because her lungs looked this bad, the radiologist wrote that she had a history of COVID-19 when in fact she had never had um, COVID-19 prior to this diagnosis. And so um, this diagnosis was fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And she worsened to the point of um, consideration for a lung transplant, but fortunately got on a treatment that um, she has now seen some improvements despite still requiring supplemental oxygen from time to time. Um, and if we think about the socioeconomic cost, um, by the time she presented to Selikoff, she had been out of work for one month. And so after vacation days and sick days were exhausted, she had no income coming in and we were not able to return her to work due to um, her severely compromised respiratory status. Um, so she subsequently lost her health insurance, with, which further delayed her receiving the necessary evaluation and treatment. And of course, there's um, also potentially loss of employment if there's no improvement or recovery, which um, would enable a worker to return to work. Um, in her case, she had to leave the job as per she could not return to it. Um, there was also psychosocial issues that arose um, in terms of loss of independence. And then she was more dependent on her family for assistance. Um, there was a toll taken on her romantic relationship. 
um, because her health significantly altered their dynamics. And I'm sure there's a number of other ways that we can um, think of how this could have negatively impacted her life. Um, so just to bring you back home and end on a happy note, um, her condition um, is considered a work-related injury or illness um, because it was um, her occupational exposure that caused it and that she's entitled to be covered under workers' compensation. Um, her referral to Selikoff had, and a thorough evaluation of her exposures enabled us to pinpoint the causative agent of her illness. Um, we had a broad differential with a focus on environmental and occupational exposures. And again, she was occupationally exposed to this mold. She didn't have it in her home. She didn't have it anywhere else. It was only at work she um, encountered it. And it led to the development of hypersensitivity in the mold. And so we were able to put a name to her issue, not only for her, um, but, you know, in order to enable her to get the treatment that she needed. And so she, she received reassurance that her illness was very real and treatable. Uh, the workers' compensation system, uh, we also provide aid in um, accessing the system. And while it differs from state to state, uh, most hold in common that they require um, a physician to pri provide an opinion on the causal relationship between an exposure and an injury or illness. Um, these cases can sometimes be litigated, and so we may be called on for depositions. Again, very complex system, but fortunately, we have um, workers comp, um, workers compensation, and patient service coordinators that are very knowledgeable about the workers compensation system. And so we were able to provide her with the necessary information and documentation to engage in the system um, to um, get financial coverage for her lost time lost work time um, and her medical expenses related to her illness, which was more likely than not, meaning it was more than 51% certain that it was a result of her occupational exposure. Um, her case was a prolonged one due to some pushback from the insurance um, carrier, but she did in the end um, triumph and get a settlement, including coverage of her medical expenses from when she became sick and in perpetuity, meaning they would go back, pay for any of the expenses she incurred um, during the time that they were kind of saying, no, no, no. And then going forward, um, any expenses, any medical expenses that she has um, in relation to this um, condition will be covered by them. And so. We also have um, social workers that provide um, support to gain access to social services and vocational rehab services to help um, people sharpen or gain skills to get back into the workforce in another field if necessary. Um, she was able to get emergency Medicaid to enable continued evaluation um, after the loss of her employer health insurance. And so um, this allowed her to get the pulmonology care that she needed, further assessment, it was a, quite a few different uh, specialists, um, but she was able to get that care with the emergency Medicaid to kind of bridge until um, her workers' compensation benefits really kicked in. Um, and she was uh, not able to return to her former role at all. Um, she was essentially 100% disabled from that occupation. Um, so she benefited from vocational rehab and then she um, decided to return to school and pursue a career in computer science. Um, and so lastly, I'd like to share that I think the take home message from this case is that taking a good occupational history involves like evaluation of the environments that patients are exposed to regularly. It helped us to identify her um, illness. Um, which enabled us to provide her the necessary assistance to gain access to the services she needed to get well, to continue to get well. She's still in the process. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Akinshilo and Dr. Glavina for the wonderful presentation. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes left for Q&A. Um, so please type your continue to type your questions um, in the Q&A section. 
I'm going to read a couple of them. Um, so the first one is, are there any resources you can recommend to learn more about the field of occupational health and occupational health assessment? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so if for those who have access to up to date, um, there's a fantastic overview of occupational health history. Uh, and I believe Agata had shared the article. And if you wanted to learn more about the field of occupational medicine, I think ACOM is a great place uh, to go to as well as uh, ABPM websites. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question um, is, I think related Dr. Akinshila to the last part of your presentation. Um, and is um, what state benefits are available to sick and injured workers? In New York State, there's New York State workers' compensation. Um, and so I can't speak to the exact minute details of all the benefits that are um, available, but at least you know, if a condition you know, is occupationally related, then workers' compensation will cover the cost of your treatment um, for that condition. And it, just to add an important part is uh, making sure that they, you can get paid, right? You recoup some of the wages that you may have lost uh, from inability to work. Great, thank you so much for that. And, and I think also important to know is that if, if a worker is not sure if they have a work-related exposure, coming to an occupational medicine physician is always important. And we are in a position where we can say that we are not going to charge the worker during that investigative period where we're determining whether or not it, it is actually a work-related injury illness. So I think that takes a little bit of pressure off um, especially if you're off of work. Um, so the other question, um, what are the benefits of assessing patients for work-related injuries or illnesses and referring to an occupational health clinic? This is a good overview question for the entire presentation. Can you repeat the question? Yes. What are the benefits of assessing patients for work-related injuries or illnesses and referring to an occupational health clinic? Uh, so I, I can take the question. I, I think the benefits are really what we had tried to demonstrate uh, with our presentation. Number one is it can help you um, with the differential diagnosis, um, it can help you narrow down and arrive at the correct diagnosis. Uh, it can help you, of course, uh, with treatment, um, you know, removing somebody from a toxic exposure, uh, whether it's a physical hazard or um, uh, another um, environmental hazard, will inevitably have a uh, you know, profound impact on their disease progression. Um, and of course, treatment success. And uh, from a psychosocial perspective, uh, it's very important to offer the, uh, uh, the supportive network, uh, the safety net uh, that is available, that the workers may be completely and totally unaware of. Um, who also help them dissipate some of the fears uh, that may be uh, incorrectly um, uh, circulated, uh, such as loss of job or you know, suing your employer when you file workers' comp, which is really not the case at all. Um, so I think the benefits are multifactorial. And um, luckily, we have the capacity and the expertise uh, to help these patients in need. Thank you, Dr. Glabina. Um, we see another question. Um, are sleep and depression included in the patient history? Yeah, so th that's another great question. So you, you have to really, what, what we have presented was the occupational medicine 
part of the history. Uh, sleep, uh, any history of men, you know, mental health assessment in general is a, obviously a critical part and by no means should be excluded. Uh, you know, past medical history is uh, definitely not mutually exclusive with occupational health history. So yes, it is very important to focus on all aspects uh, during your review of systems. Just the OCH Health offers that other review of systems aspect of exposures. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so if there are no other questions, um, thank you to our presenters um, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, and a quick reminder that if you would like to receive CME credits, please sign the sign-in sheet that's posted in the chat and fill out the course evaluation form. Um, and we will be in touch with the certificates of attendance shortly. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of the day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.